Hi everyone, this is Tony Williams with the Bill of Rights Institute. I'm a senior teaching fellow with the Institute and we welcome all of our teachers and students and fellow citizens to another installment of our primary source close read. And this is gonna be a great one because it's on the Declaration of Sentiments, which is from July, 1848. And it was a declaration of the women uh, and some men uh, at the Seneca Falls Convention. And we are really honored to have a special scholar guest with us, uh, Emily Crickbaum. And she, uh, let me introduce her, tell you a little bit about her. Uh, she was a professor uh, for nearly 10 years uh, at the Ashton University Ashbrook Center, where she worked with uh, not only college students, but also teachers uh, throughout the summers and on various Teaching American History seminars. Uh, and so uh, she also moved over to the Columbus School for Girls recently, where she is uh, the department chair in teaching history and civics and, and working with young people. And so you have a, a great deal of experience with, 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 with young people uh, teaching and also teaching teachers, uh, which is what we do here at the Bill of Rights Institute. Uh, and she also has a website, rememberTheLadiesHistory.com. So make sure to check that out. And uh, I don't see uh, your beloved companion uh, dog there. Um, whom I've seen on previous conversations we've had, but but welcome very much to uh, to our close read. Thank you so much, Tony. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and uh, maybe we should uh, go ahead and dive right in. Uh, I was wondering, Emily, if you could just give us a, a little bit of background on uh, the events or just some general background history on on helping us to frame up this document. Absolutely. And I, I know a lot of times in classrooms, there's what you want to do, and then there's what you can do with the time that you have. And so I think one of the most beneficial ways to approach this document is to talk a little bit about the status of women during the antebellum era, and even previous to that. And so one of the terms that I introduce to my students is femme covert. And that is essentially the idea that the female is covered after they become married and they are covered politically, socially, economically, essentially that the man represents them and they're civilly and politically dead in the eyes of the law. And so that's the, the context that we're working from as far as uh, what it looks like to be a, a white woman um, in antebellum society. And one of the reasons why the Seneca Falls Convention happens and that we have uh, this declaration of sentiments that we'll be looking at is in large part because women were so active in the anti-slavery movement. And uh, many of you know the story, Tony, I know that you know that uh, in 1840, when uh, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton met on their way to the anti-slavery convention, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was actually on her honeymoon, I believe. Uh, very romantic. And uh, she was very excited to meet Lucretia Mott and really had this uh, wild girl crush on her and, and hadn't really seen uh, a woman uh, be able to display that intellectual capacity in the public sphere before and was excited to see what Mott would say at, on the international stage. But when they get there, um, Mott is not able to speak. In fact, Stanton and Mott have to sit behind a curtain because of their sex. And so they had kind of made this pact in the moment very passionately that they would go back to the United States and they would have a women's convention uh, to talk about the issues that women faced that really came to light as they were fighting the battle for those that were enslaved. Uh, now this doesn't happen until eight years later, in part because Elizabeth Cady Stanton is married and has a number of children. Um, but also I think we can all relate that there are moments in life where you get on fire for certain ideas and thoughts. And then when you go back to the day to day, uh, you know, it can tend to be forgotten. But Lucretia Mott was visiting her sister in New York uh, years later. And it was at that time that she thought, you know, I'm gonna talk to Stanton and we're gonna rekindle this friendship. And that's what led to the Seneca Falls Convention. Great, and we're gonna 
move over. And uh, this, and and they produced this very very important document, right? And uh, the the Declaration of Sentiments is, is clearly modeled upon another very important document, uh, the Declaration of Independence. And and so my first question, really related to this document, is is why the Declaration of Independence? They, they could have chosen, you know, the Constitution. They could have chosen other kinds of, of statements arguing specifically uh, for women's rights. Why, why did they choose the Declaration of Independence? Well, there are many reasons that this could be. I mean, one, this is an incredibly familiar formula, right? It's something that individuals will recognize almost immediately. Um, it is in July right as well and so you know the, the, this may be fresh because as thomas jefferson said the way that you celebrate on the fourth is that you read the declaration but i think most importantly uh, the declaration of independence uh, the intellectual foundation for that is the idea of natural rights that everything that comes from the declaration is rooted in the idea of natural rights and everything that comes from uh, the majority of what comes from the Declaration of Sentiments is rooted in the idea of natural rights as well. And so I think what Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Maud, among the other authors, were doing here is if we believe and we celebrate this, if this is something that we all can get behind the Declaration of Independence, then the Declaration of Sentiments is not necessarily this radical idea. Instead, it's an extension of what we celebrate every 4th of July. Yeah, very good. So, so recognizable as a 4th of July document and, and demonstrating, as you say, those, those Lockean principles of, mm -hmm. of created, uh, created equal, uh, mm -hmm. of natural rights, and, and then the, you know, the idea of consensual government, which, which women didn't necessarily participate in. Uh, which leads me to my next question. Uh, you know, the women of Seneca Falls do add, uh, as we see, all men and women are created equal in their inalienable rights and in the consent of the governed. So, so why, why are all these Lockean principles really important? Why, why do they appeal to them? Well, I, I think one of the main reasons for this, as we said, the Lockean principles that um, all men and women possess the same natural rights to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, that just governments must derive from the consent of the governed. And so, um, again, if these are principles that we celebrate, if women are politically dead when they're married and their husbands really are those that are their representatives, their virtual representatives, the ones that govern over them, Stanton and Mott would argue it's without our consent. Um, and that this government does not exist for the benefit of the governed, but instead for the government itself. And so in the same way that the colonists are, are shouting across the pond to King George III, women, because they are um, politically dead, are kind of shouting to uh, the man as well. Although I should say that Lucretia Mott's husband was there and was in support of this idea and in fact on the second day was moderating this so this was not all men necessarily but those that did not provide a sphere of action for women to develop individually and frederick douglas was there as well as well as uh, what about 30 men or so um, mm -hmm. yeah and and so maybe let's talk a little bit more about this idea of consent right because if, if women are as you say politically dead or civilly dead so they're not serving on juries, uh, they're not voting. They're, so I think what you're saying is that they're not participating in the way that men are in this government. They're not actually giving their consent to the laws. Uh, they're, they're, they're not being represented. Is it, Correct, so? they're, not being represented. they're not being represented. They don't have the right to vote, to choose who their representatives are. They are being taxed. Right. So, uh, so this is again, there, there are many and, you know, in my uh, high school teacher mode that I'm in right now, I can think of three columns that I'm now creating. Right. To compare the Declaration of Sentiments and the specifics. But, you know, there's no taxation without representation, you know, argument that you could draw a parallel for. So absolutely. Right. So just like the colonists, no taxation without representation. Very good. 
All right, so the document uh, also mentions repeated injuries and usurpations, right? Again, going back to King George and, and the declaration and, and the list of grievances. Uh, but this one focus in, focuses in on women specifically. And so can you provide maybe just a, a few examples uh, of this, this long train of abuses, if you will, uh, from the document and the history of the period to, to help illustrate this? Yes, absolutely. And, and as you already mentioned, this is something that uh, Thomas Jefferson did with King George III. And this is something that uh, women will call out for men as well. And these that are listed on the screen, um, he's never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise, to the vote. And this is, um, as you know, Tony, the only one that was uh, controversial. Uh, at Seneca Falls, and something we can talk about later, um, that he has compelled her to submit to laws where she has no representation. He's withheld from her rights, which are given to the most ignorant and degraded men. And this is, as an aside, this is a pattern that Stan will use for years, and it's not a good look. I wrote a chapter on this uh, for a book, but it, so, it, um, yeah. Tell us a little bit more about this. This is, you know, this is very striking that, that the women arguing for their rights and using the Declaration of Independence would actually put that in there. Correct. So at times it seems they're calling for this universal rights, universal suffrage, and then doing this quick shift to an environment of scarcity of, okay, so if we are going to be selective, right, then it should be the most educated and the refined, the most refined of society. And you'll see this rear its ugly head with the debates over the 15th Amendment uh -huh. late, later on as well. Um, because it, if, it, if it can't be all of us, it should certainly be us. And I'm, I guess I'm symbolically <laughs> pointing to myself as Elizabeth Cady Stanton. <laughs> I would not agree with her arguments by any sense of the so you're saying it, they you're saying that they were saying that it should be white women who at, at least many or most were, were literate and some were educated and you know not you know as they say ignorant degraded natives and foreigners uh, african americans those who uh, didn't know how to read and, and that kind of thing Right, many of those that were at the Seneca Falls Convention were, uh, for that time, relatively wealthy, um, you know, established uh, Quaker families. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton came from uh, a very respected home and uh, had received great schooling. And so again, while uh, the call is for universal, I, I think when, it, when the rubber hits the road, it can become much more divisive, uh, to say the least. Okay, interesting. And, and we've talked a lot about political and civil rights, but I also notice here a few grievances that are sort of targeted towards um, you know, economic and, and educational opportunities and, and that kind of thing, if you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So I always find this third one uh, on, on the slide interesting, that he has made her morally an irresponsible being. This idea that if, if a woman commits uh, some sort of immoral action. It's a reflection on the husband and not necessarily on herself, right? That she has the responsibility of her, her husband or of her parents. Uh, and this is a very similar argument that Frederick Douglass will make as well with the institution of slavery and the idea that the institution does not create responsible, hardworking human beings either. And you'll see a lot of parallels in the way in which both um, women's rights advocates and abolitionists speak of so many of these hierarchies taking away any sort of accountability. Um, and then the other thing that you see to mention the economic component, because a lot of this is political, civil and political rights, um, legal discrimination against married women, but then the rights of women in work and education in the church, this, this idea that how can we prove that we are truly equal to you if we don't have access to these sorts of institutions? And so, you know, that would, Tony, if I were to say that I were faster than you and challenging you to a race, but then never allowing you to race me, right, and to prove that you are indeed faster than me, if that's true. Uh, you know, it's a very similar thing in suggesting that women are not as intelligent, and yet 
Elizabeth Cady Stanton could not go to college, could not continue her education with the same boys that she went to school with, and is, is relegated to this different uh, sphere, which goes to, I think, maybe one of the most significant lines in the Declaration of Sentiments in that uh, man's usurpation of the prerogative of Jehovah himself, right? That, that man is acting as a god, and oh is that the next slide and, and determining sure that's where it is but and determining the status and the sphere of action assigning her an action as opposed to uh, that being according to her conscience and her god right so. right but, yeah very powerful so so really a, a full civil political economic educational professional mm -hmm. Uh, religious, uh, just a complete equality, really, is, is what they're aiming for, as, as equal human beings. Right, as, as full and equal human beings, right? This idea that you're not even able to develop into who, know, who knows what you could be. Right, right. Okay, excellent. And, and why, but, and, and so we say, all, you know, we're looking at the whole picture here in the document, and, and yet clearly, you know, the right of suffrage, the, the, the right to vote was, was really one of the core arguments here. And as you say, the most divisive, and maybe you want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but how does not having this right to vote, how does it affect, you know, women's citizenship and ability to participate in the American regime? How does, how does it affect it so broadly? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer your first question, just because that'll be much easier. Um, but one of the reasons why this resolution for the vote was so divisive is that this is the first real organized conversation about women's rights. Um, just in the last few years, there's legislation passed in New York about married women being able to keep their property when they're right. I mean, this is this, we are just, we are barely pouring the cup of tea. It's like, would you like to talk about women's rights? I mean, this is the first, uh, Continental Congress. I always like to compare it to the first Continental Congress, where we're not ready for a full-blown revolution yet. We're just saying we don't really like what the king is doing, but we're trying to put words as to why we don't like it, right? Because that's not really powerful. Like, we don't like what you're doing, as opposed to why don't we and what principles do we believe in that go against that treatment. Uh, so that, that's one part. And Lucretia Mott said, Lizzie, referring to Elizabeth Kitty Stanton, you're gonna make a mockery out of this, right? Like nobody's gonna take us seriously if we just go that far that quickly and say it that loudly. And so I think uh, there was a, an issue of prudence, but then you also are hanging out with a bunch of Quakers and Garrisonians who don't believe in the idea of voting because the whole system is corrupt for them, right? I mean, this isn't a case of a car needing new tires, it's a lemon, right? Like we're not gonna drive the thing and we're not going to try and take it to the voting booth. So that's, that's the one, why, just why are we even asking for this? Um, and then of course, you know, the, the importance of the vote is to hold your representatives accountable that they actually represent you and that your voice is being heard and that you are truly uh, a, a full citizen in this society. Uh, and I, I keep referring to Frederick Douglass, but it, there are worse people that you could reference, right? I mean, he's, he's one of my, my favorite human beings to discuss that, you know, if you, um, he would always say in, in the arguments for the 15th Amendment, that it doesn't matter how many economic rights you have. It doesn't matter if you own property. If you don't have the right to vote, you, you can't protect it. Right, it doesn't matter all of these other things that you could develop, that you could earn, that you could work for, it can be taken away almost immediately if you, if you aren't able to hold those accountable that are allegedly representing you. So that's, that's the crux of it. So this idea of consent goes right to the heart, not, and really not only just of, of popular self-government, but really of being a full human being, like you're saying, right? And Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Keep your property and, and and you know all, all of your natural rights uh, based upon your consent. This is really at the heart of everything, really at the foundation. Because if you want to affect any sort of change in any of these resolutions, right? I mean, people are, are teasing Lizzie for even suggesting this. And as an aside, um, Douglas is the one that helped her write that 
that very sentence that appears in the sentiments and was one of the few that joined her uh, to rally for people voting for this so that he would even make it on the list of sentiments. But all of these would have very little effect, I think, if you didn't have that vote undergirding all of it. Right. Absolutely right. And and so uh, and this is so important because it does take a while, about some 70 years or so uh, before the 19th Amendment is, is ratified. And, and of course, uh, I was remiss earlier for not mentioning it's our 100th anniversary of, of the ratification. And so how does the women's suffrage movement, again, in, a, in about a minute or two, uh, <laughs> how, how did it develop over the next following, you know, the 70 years following the, the Seneca mm -hmm. Falls Convention? How, how does all this culminate in that 19th Amendment so powerfully? It was a very clear, easy, linear progression <laughs> up. <laughs> kidding, kidding. I hope nobody's taking notes in ink. That was, I was just making sure you were paying attention. No, so um, immediately after the Seneca Falls Convention, it, there are people talking, right? Whether you like it or don't like it, um, it's, it starts the conversation. And between the Seneca Falls Convention and the Civil War, you see 30 similar conventions occur throughout the United States. Uh, which I think is incredibly important. And one in Akron, Ohio with Sojourner Truth and the most immediate one two weeks later in Rochester, New York, which is very close by. But once the Civil War starts, as we see in our history, anytime a war begins, reform at home goes silent, right? That especially in a type of, I don't know if we necessarily want to call the Civil War a total war, but I, I tend to categorize it as such. I mean, even during World War I, uh, when W.E.B. Du Bois says, we need to close ranks and we need to support our country. And Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton especially believed this because they said, in a similar way as African Americans in the tradition of, if we prove that we are patriotic and we are loyal citizens, that after this war is over, in a sense, we'll be rewarded for that. And so these two women start, um, patriotic clubs in support of the Union cause. However, as we know, after the, the Civil War ends, uh, there is a push to abolish the institution of slavery with the 13th Amendment to gain the rights of citizenship with the 14th Amendment, and then to grant uh, universal male suffrage, uh, black ink on white paper, right? Universal male suffrage with the 15th Amendment. And it's with that argument of the 15th Amendment that you see a split in the women's suffrage movement because about half of those women uh, would say, I thought we were for universal suffrage and how could African-American men not be on our side and push to include us? Whereas Frederick Douglass would say to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the day that you're in fear of being lynched when you walk down the street is the day that I will support you over, over us, right? That if, if there can be at least someone to get it, let it, let it be what he would say, the Negro. Um, so you have this split and these two groups of women suffragists will not come back together till about the turn of the century. And um, my, uh, I, I love to hate Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, because she will, she will not help the cause by any sense uh, of the imagination. She will write, uh, the Bible entirely from the woman's perspective around the turn of the century when she gets older. And I, I'm not suggesting this of all people, but we know generally speaking, broad strokes when people get older, the filter right, it becomes thinner, and she just starts to say exactly what she wants, and it has a, a negative effect on the movement that I would argue puts it back uh, a number of years. You also start to see um, a, a new wave of suffragists being influenced by more radical and revolutionary tactics uh, of their, uh, their sisters across the pond and staging protests. And Alice Paul and, and oh, yes, exactly. Thank you of Alice Paul, um, among others, who will pick at a wartime president right during World War One, and calling Woodrow Wilson. I mean, you, you you just didn't do that then, right? Like, I mean, you don't 
you don't really do that now, but you really didn't do that then. And so they're picketing a wartime president and telling Woodrow Wilson to take the beam out of his own eye. And if this is a war for democracy, this is a pretty bad look because, you know, 50% of Americans don't have the right to vote. And so while this could be uh, another lecture, another class entirely, I know that you told me to be brief. Right. <laughs> and I, I will focus on that. But I think that the, um, the combination of tactics that increase media attention and spectacle, as well as the state by state strategy of more conservative suffragists developed a greater momentum to allow Woodrow Wilson uh, to throw his support behind women's suffrage and to help get the 19th Amendment passed through Congress. Though I would not suggest that and the takeaway should not be that Wilson was the, the advocate uh, or supporter of women's suffrage, but I think he felt cornered to, to do so. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, well, that's been a very illuminating discussion, Emily. Um, I'd also be remiss if I did mention uh, some of our curricula that, that deal with the Declaration of Sentiments and with the Seneca Falls uh, Convention one of which you were uh, a leading scholar on reviewing, and, and that's our women's suffrage curriculum, which we're, we're highlighting this year uh, because of the 100th anniversary, but we'll continue to highlight it because of its importance in American history, uh, as well as uh, this topic also appears in our American Portraits uh, collection. It's gonna appear in our Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness, our new U.S. history textbook that's going to be free online, as well as uh, several of our other materials. And so I encourage all of our teachers and students and citizens to, to check that out. And uh, thank you so much again for, for coming on uh, and helping uh, walk us through this document and, and really illuminate its, its meaning uh, for the American regime and also its, its historical context. It was a real pleasure. Thank you for having me, Tony. All right.